straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Prosecutors give the okay to test for DNA on key items of evidence in the so-called fatal attraction killing. The truth here requires scientific testing. The former teacher out on parole after 27 years behind bars for the murder of her former lover's wife and her attorney's quest to clear her name. When somebody's wrongfully convicted, the real killer is always out there and will never be prosecuted. A North Carolina district attorney announces no charges for two deputies in the fatal shooting of Andrew Brown. Will it be guilty or an acquittal for a former Florida deputy accused of planting drugs on unsuspecting motorists? And the jury is now seated in the trial of an Iowa man accused of murdering a college student and leaving her body in a cornfield. Plus, fireworks in the courtroom as the trial of Robert Durst in the murder of his best friend, Susan Berman, resumes. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. The trial of millionaire real estate heir Robert Durst in the murder of his best friend has resumed after a 14 month pause. The New York real estate heir is accused of killing his best friend, Susan Berman, in her Los Angeles home in December 2000. Durst's trial had three days of openings and 10 witnesses take the stand before COVID-19 postponed the trial on March 12, 2020. 12 people plus 11 alternates made up the jury, but one alternate was removed after looking at a news article. Both sides got two hours to recap their openings from last year. The defense maintains that Durst didn't kill Berman and doesn't know who did. Prosecutor John Lewin says Berman's death had a direct link to the disappearance of Robert Durst's first wife, Kathleen Durst, in 1982, and tied it to the death of his Texas neighbor, Morris Black, in 2001. We believe that the evidence in this case is going to show that he is responsible for the disappearance and the death of his missing wife, Kathy McCormick Durst. We're going to show that Robert Durst murdered his close friend and confidant, Susan Berman. And we're gonna show that he did that with the motive and because she was a witness, and by witness meaning that she assisted him in covering up the killing of his wife almost 20 years earlier. Robert Durst killed, dismembered, and dumped Morris Black's corpse, his body parts, in trash bags into Galveston Bay three killings that we are going to prove. He's charged with the murder of Susan Berman. He is charged with the special circumstance that that was a witness killing. And in order to prove the witness killing, we need to prove to you what she was a witness to, which means we're going to be putting on evidence that Mr. Durst killed Kathy Durst. But before openings even began, things got heated in the courtroom. A screaming match broke out on Monday afternoon over the admissibility of testimony that a witness claimed to see Kathy Durst after she disappeared. Whether or not the court believes it's relevant, whether or not the court believes 352, whether or not the theory and the information and evidence that they have produced is consistent with it, then the court can make a ruling. Your Honor, can I just... Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hey, Mr. Bailey, hey, hold on, hold on, please. Your Honor, well, let me... Let's see if the hearing's loud or something like that. <laughs> He's got his hands on. Oh. Look, this isn't some late-arrived theory. We've known from the beginning that Eddie Lopez saw Kathy Durst on February the 1st. They say they offered to uh, stipulate to that. No, they offered to stipulate to anything that was otherwise admissible. This is a, it was clearly a hearsay statement. So we couldn't stipulate that. So, but th that, 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 you that, 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 No, you may not continue. We are going to be silent now. Here with us today is civil rights attorney Jeff Storms and Terry Austin. Jeff, 
get your popcorn and your candy in a lounge chair because it's going to be a while. That's what ADA or the prosecutor Lewin said about crossing Durst. What did you make of the prosecution's arguments in this little spat? Well, first I'll say popcorn was fitting, Brian, because that's kind of what got Mr. Durst into trouble was his cooperation with that documentary. But with respect to the argument, you know, what they're arguing over is hearsay, right? Out of court statements intended to prove the truth of the matter. Here, you know, I don't know how much the public understands, but generally lawyers aren't allowed to have hearsay admitted. But then there is a laundry list of excuses which lawyers can throw into the air in hopes that that hearsay can be admitted. So that's what this argument was over. Here, basically, uh, there really isn't a clear theory as to why this hearsay should be admitted. It sounds like they're attempting to use uh, the effect of the Lipsner uh, exception which is pretty much a desperation move, in my opinion. And it's highly unlikely this is going to be admitted, at least based on that argument alone. Yeah. Now, Terry, I get it's an adversarial system, but this is the first time I've seen a judge give a timeout in the middle of the court. It doesn't look like this evidence is coming in because of the back and forth, but what did you make of how the judge handled the situation? Listen, on the one hand, this seems like a no-nonsense judge. It was like a timeout. It almost sounded as though he was talking to his children. But on the other hand, I think he allowed for this to occur. He jokes a lot. He lets the two attorneys talk to themselves. I think it got to a point where he had to put his foot down. He's expecting a certain amount of decorum, and he had to admonish them to bring it back to that so that there's respect and professionalism. Yeah. Of course, we'll continue to see that brawling between those two sides. It's almost like a boxing match. They have to go to their corners. Law and Crime is covering that case with live gavel to gavel coverage. Make sure to check it out. Thank you both. Let's turn to another trial we're following on the Law and Crime Network. A jury is now seated in the trial of Christian Bahena Rivera. He's accused of murdering college student Molly Tibbetts. And Jeanette Levy tells us what lawyers are asking the prospective jurors. This trial was moved to Scott County, so a fair and impartial jury could be seated to hear the case against Christian Bahena Rivera. There have been eight women and seven men selected to sit on the jury. Three of them are alternates. Bahena Rivera is accused of murdering Molly Tibbetts back in July of 2018. Prosecutors say Bahena Rivera confessed to arguing with Tibbetts and then blacking out during an 11-hour interrogation. Police say Bahena Rivera led them to Tibbetts' body in a cornfield in Powashik County. Now nearly three years later, cameras are not allowed inside the event center where prospective jurors are being questioned here in Davenport, Iowa. They've been asked about whether they feel Bahena Rivera being an undocumented immigrant should impact how he's treated by the criminal justice system. They've also been asked whether they believe police are perfect or they make mistakes. And Bahena Rivera's attorneys have asked the pool whether they've ever heard of what's called a false confession. Opening statements will begin early Wednesday morning at the Scott County Courthouse. In Davenport, Iowa, I'm Anjanette Levy for Law and Crime Daily. Thanks, Anjanette. And be sure to tune in to Law and Crime Network for gavel gavel coverage of that trial. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, why prosecutors say there's no charges in the shooting. Welcome back to North Carolina. Sheriff deputies will not be facing charges in the fatal shooting of Andrew Brown Jr. The local district attorney called Brown's death, quote, tragic but justified. The sheriff's office says deputies were attempting to arrest 42-year-old Brown on felony drug charges. Some of the body cam footage of the shooting was made public for the first time. The deputies can be seen in the back of a truck, then approaching Brown's car. The car then starts to drive away, and the deputies fire. The DA's office says the deputies shot and killed Brown after he struck them twice with his vehicle. Let's bring in civil rights attorney Jeff Storms. Jeff, this is in your wheelhouse. What's your reaction to this video? Well, it's not the video itself as much as how it was re released for me, Brian. This was a political and PR move by the prosecutor's office. They showed us only small segments of the video, which support the conclusion they want the public to reach about this shooting. You know, we can hear from the lawyers for, you know, his family, Mr. Brown's family, who are going to tell us we need to see the entire videos because the videos we can see 
it certainly doesn't look like Mr. Brown intended to run over an officer despite having the opportunity to do so. So I think we need to take the release of this video for what it is, a release intended to support the conclusion of the prosecution's declination of charges. And as we said earlier in North Carolina, the way it works for that video to be released, it has to be court ordered. Perhaps we'll see that in the coming future. Thanks, Jeff. Now to Florida, where a jury has given a mixed verdict for a former deputy charged with planting drugs on unsuspecting motorists. Count one, guilty of racketeering as charged. Count seven, guilty of official misconduct related to Teresa Odom as charged. Count nine, guilty of official misconduct related to Joshua Manuel as charged. Count 10, guilty of official misconduct related to Stephen Van as charged. Out of 67 charges, a jury of six found Zachary Wester guilty of 19 of them. Twelve victims took the stand during the trial. Prosecutors say Wester took advantage of them and planted drugs in their car. A jury of six determined that was only the case for three of the victims, Teresa Odom, Joshua Emanuel, and Stephen Van. Wester was found guilty of three counts of official misconduct, perjury, fabricating evidence, and possession of drug paraphernalia. He was also found guilty of four counts of possession of a controlled substance, two counts of false imprisonment, and one count of racketeering. Zachary Wester took the stand in his own defense, and he said he's innocent. You did not plan any evidence? That never crossed my mind, no. This is, these were legitimate stops, searches, and you found illegal narcotics? Yes, sir. After the verdict was read, the former deputy was cuffed and sent to jail. Sentencing will be at a later date. Let's bring in co-host Terry Austin about the verdict. Terry, mixed verdict, guilty on only three of the 12 witnesses that testified. Can you make heads or tails of this for us? You know, I think it's always good when you get a mixed verdict because the evidence is really showing the jurors something in connection with three of the 12. I mean, they found the racketeering count, but for the three, I think it made sense. For instance, Teresa Odom, of course, the video was clear. So they saw that. They saw the planting of the evidence. For Joshua Emanuel, because the FDLA said in their report that Wester did not activate his body cam until after discovering the evidence, I think the jury saw that as being culpable. And the same thing happened with Steve Van. The FDLA said that Wester only turned the body cam on after he began the search. So they did not like that. The other individuals, it was a little touch and go. The camera was on, but you couldn't see. And so I think for the rest of them, they said, no, we can't find a, gu a guilty verdict. Sounds like the jury really stuck to the guidelines of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, where there was reasonable doubt in the others. They found an acquittal. Where there was uh, guilty on those counts, they went with guilty. Thanks, Terry. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, a deadly affair. Did a school teacher shoot her former lover's wife over a fatal attraction? It was dubbed the fatal attraction killing, but a woman convicted of... Oh, God, I and you're here with a strange girl being a naughty boy. I don't think having dinner with anybody is a crime. It was two years after the 1987 hit starring Glenn Close and Michael Douglas, Carolyn Wormus was just 23 years old and began an affair with a 40-year-old Paul Solomon. Both were elementary school teachers in Scarsdale, New York. That affair turned deadly. I guess you thought you'd get away with it. Well, you can't. Betty Jean Solomon was shot nine times in the back and legs on January 15, 1989. And prosecutors say similarities to what happened in the Solomon murder and in the movie are uncanny. Investigators looked to her husband, Paul, who was known to have multiple affairs, but he seemed to have an alibi. Warmus reported began to talk to Solomon after he left her for a new woman and apparently bought a gun days before the murder. She was later charged with second-degree murder and weapons possession. Prosecutors say Warmus shot Solomon, then met up with Paul for drinks at a hotel bar and had sex with him in his car. Her defense says she was framed. What he did in this case was he copied scenes out of the movie to appeal to the jury about certain acts, which when you look at it in retrospect, it was all a frame up. It was all a frame up. And uh, it's a shame. O'Hara himself was exonerated of a felony conviction 20 years later. He's one of a number of lawyers now representing Warmus. Some of the red flags that have our, our attention is that the spouse of the victim uh, testified under immunity. You know, he was actually an alternative suspect, and yet he was, you know, so how many people, if your spouse is murdered and you, you're a witness in that trial, you have to have immunity. Uh, another person, uh, a uh, 
private investigator also who took the stand against Carolyn. He also was given immunity. He claimed to have sold, you know, the, the gun to her. Warmer's first trial ended in a hung jury. But two years later, she was tried again, this time convicted. The new piece of evidence was a glove later found by the victim's husband. But the difference between the first trial, which ended in, in a mistrial, uh, that was eight to four, uh, and the second trial where she was convicted is that there was a glove that was admitted into evidence. That glove is found three years after the first trial by the husband, you know, who, uh, again, is an alternative suspect. He was offered $100,000 uh, for a movie if she, if she was found guilty. Uh, this private investigator who alleges he sold Carolyn the gun. Uh, he himself has now uh, been arrested and convicted of witness tampering in the case that recently happened. Jeff Doskovich was prosecuted by the same district attorney's office when he was 17 and convicted. DNA testing later exonerated him. Doskovich says the same medical examiner in his case skewed his testimony in favor of the prosecution in Warmus's case. It has the presence of Dr. Rowe, who's a medical examiner who actually altered evidence in my case. Uh, Dr. Rowe uh, initially estimated the time of death as being between 2 and 6 p.m. And upon learning that Carolyn uh, ha was in a restaurant with the with uh, the husband of the, of the victim, he suddenly changed his time of death to between 6 to 8, which had the impact of canceling out uh, her alibi. When we come back, more on those key pieces of evidence, why the defense is requesting new DNA testing, and the prosecutor's response on the... Welcome back. We're continuing our report into the conviction of Carolyn Warmus for the murder of her former lover's wife. She spent 27 years in prison, but key pieces of evidence will get new DNA testing after her successful appeal. One thing that you have to remember is that from the moment... DNA testing could clear her name. If she admitted to the crime, she may have gotten out a lot sooner than she did. She did 27 years, and she steadfastly... Um, maintained her innocence throughout this whole uh, ordeal. And we're hoping that this um, DNA testing will, will finally exonerate her. A judge last year denied the defense's motion for new testing, but they appealed. And just before oral arguments, Westchester District Attorney Mimi Roja gave the green light for DNA testing on a tote bag, semen, and a glove. So they can actually test for that. It doesn't have to be blood. They can test for it now. Because when you're in a glove for a long period of time, I'll guarantee you whoever had that glove on has wear DNA. That's the first thing. But more importantly, remember, there's other suspects here, supposedly, and no one's denigrating anybody. Supposedly, she was having a relationship, the, uh, the decedent, with other people, and the husband was having a relationship. She has semen in the vaginal vault. That semen has never been tested. We don't know whether somebody came on the scene. We don't know whether it was a, a, a lover or a boyfriend. We don't know whether it was somebody was paid to come on the scene. We simply don't know. Why not test all of the evidence to get a whole picture? Crime scene photos show the glove next to the body, but it wasn't collected. Before Warmus' second trial, years later, the victim's husband, Paul Solomon, found a black cashmere glove in a closet and turned it over to the prosecution. DNA experts said in 1992 that it had an insufficient amount of blood to be tested. The prosecution, you know, their position at the trial was that that glove was worn by the perpetrator. So I'm really, really, I'm really hoping that, you know, if and when that glove excludes our client, which I'm really confident it is, that we're not going to see anything troubling, that we're not going to see any theory shifting, that instead the prosecution will just accept what the science says and therefore consent to the exoneration of our client. Two out of three of us have been wrongfully convicted. I was a convicted felon for 20 years until I got my conviction overturned. Warmus is out on parole after nearly three decades behind bars, but her attorneys say it's important to set the record straight. Nobody ever got wrongfully convicted in a courtroom by accident. Let's bring in Jeff and Terry one last time. Jeff, fair to say the major difference between the two trials is this glove that was found in one of the more sketchier ways by a former suspect picking it up. If there's no DNA from Warmus on that glove, how does it affect the appeal? Well, every jury is certainly different, but you know we can look at this and say it was a hung jury the first time and the critical new piece of evidence was the glove. And so it's reasonable to conclude that that had a strong impact uh, on the second jury. Uh, with respect to the appeal, if, you know, if I understood her attorney correctly, you know, if, if her DNA is not on that glove, given that she's served her time, 
it could very well be the end of the proceeding and maybe they no longer move forward and she's exonerated. But I think, you know, there are a lot of questions in that regard with respect to family issues and things like that. Yeah. And part of the reason why we're getting the testing now is this is a new district attorney in the office as opposed to the former one who uh, was trying to stop the testing. So maybe the information changes everything. Terry, after all these years, do you think the movies, the media and the prosecution could have gotten it all wrong? Well, they could have gotten it all wrong. I mean, she was in jail for 27 years. That's a long time. And the entire time, she has said that she was innocent. And so I think the fact that the Westchester DA, Mimi Roca, the fact that she is now consenting, she said it was late notice, but she's consenting, I think that's the right thing to do. Sounds smart. Jeff, Terry, thank you. And thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.